Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Blocks to Spiritual Progression in the USA. And it is part of the general discussion series. It was presented in Dallas, Texas, USA on the 18th of February, 2012. It's good to see all of your smiling faces. <laughs> We're so grateful to be here. We're so grateful to be here. We're so happy to be Might not be after tomorrow, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's still a minute or two before everyone else comes, but I think we're pretty much right, I think, from everyone. And there's a few that we didn't expect to see, but we're glad to see you. Yeah, good to, good to meet many of you. For the first time, although we've spoken on that web for some time. And what we normally do uh, when we start is, uh, if, we, if we just let you know a bit of the basics about uh, what we normally do, Firstly, we better let you know where the toilets are. I think there are some down, right the way down the end of the corridor. Past the swimming pool. Past the swimming pool. On the, right hand, on the right hand side is where the toilets are. We will be having a break at about two hours in or so. Uh, and it depends on how long you want to make it, <laughs> as to how long it is. But generally, we'll probably be like half an hour, three quarters of an hour or something like that. Um, we haven't got that much to, to, to eat, so it'll just be, I think there's some, there's some there's coffee and water coming, water coming and uh, coffee if you're still addicted to the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Which many of you are going to be. And uh, I put some tangerines there. Oh, there's some fruit there to be the so nice. same. <laughs> and we, uh, we do record the, our sessions, as you can see, and the main reason why we record them is so that, as you know, everyone around the world can benefit from the recordings at some point. And many of you have seen the recordings, mm -hmm. but never been in one. <laughs> so now, today and tomorrow, the tables are turned. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very, very good to, uh, to, to have you a part of an audience. Um, Myself and Mary have just come from, the, from Europe. Uh, we visited England first. We had a session there one afternoon, and uh, there were around 70 people or so then, which was an interesting session. And then we went across to Sweden for two weeks, and we did uh, three talks there. It was very cold, as you can imagine, in winter. And, and then we went up north, there's a couple who are thinking of setting up a learning centre in Sweden, right up north uh, of Sweden, and it was minus 15 uh, Celsius up there, so what's that in Fahrenheit? It must be pretty low, I think, minus, in the minus 20s, isn't it, or something like that in Fahrenheit? And uh, the day after we left, it went down to minus 42 Celsius, so that's pretty cold. We've got some lovely pictures that Mary took of the snow that's so, so deep and walking through the snow to our little cabin that we had there. It was really nice. Um, and there were around about, uh, the first couple of talks, there were about 50 or 60 people there. And then the last one, there was about 75 or so uh, in, the last, in the last talk. Welcome. Sorry if there, there's just a few seats left. So. Um, then we came back to England. Uh, just briefly for a two day stopover and then we went over to Athens in Greece and we just had a small meeting there in Katerina's home. Katerina is actually here now too, so there's Katerina. Oh, that's um, you want to put your hand up Katerina so people can see you. <laughs> so we only had about probably 20, 25 people who, 27, 27 was it, yeah, who, uh, who met with us there and we enjoyed a couple of days, uh, probably five days all up in Athens. Uh, most of the time Myself and Mary rarely go travelling 
outside nowadays, we just see people mostly, so we didn't go and see the sites in Athens or anything like that. Um, we just um, went to Caterina's. There was riots in Athens. There was riots mm -hmm. in Athens the day mm -hmm. that we left, um, or the night before we left. Then we went back to England, had another session there, and there was another 60 or so people in that session. It was one of, an evening session that we had before we came over here. We, we arrived here Thursday in the afternoon, and uh, our lovely host, Robin, where is she at the moment? Oh, there she is, up the back there. And picked us up from the airport. And, uh, and actually, uh, one of the reasons why you were all gathered here today is because of Robin, actually. So, yeah. Thank you, Robin. For um, arranging some of the things that she's arranged for us. And, uh, and she checked out the different venues. We didn't, we didn't know how many would be coming, so we assumed there would be about 30 or so coming. So we chose quite a small venue here for that reason. Now, many of you would know, maybe, that you have the ability while you're here, if you're hot on it, to provide us with a USB 3 drive. Um, and it needs to be 500 gigabytes or more, and we can copy onto it all of the material that's on the web up to two, end of 2011. So all of the YouTube stuff that's been loaded on YouTube, all of the material, there's actually more talks than what's on YouTube on the disc. Uh, there's basically, I think, 146 talks on there. Uh, each of those are two hours long, so there's about three, 300 or so hours of video, and there's about 500 hours of MP3 sound recordings as well along with all of the documents that you could download from our website. It was also on there. And it's, it's for free, as long as you give us the disc, we'll be able to copy it. However, um, I'll be only able to copy it until while we're here, of course. And then uh, Michael, who's, you want to? Michael, I've given Michael a copy of all the material. So he has the ability, if you, if you don't bring a disc with you and you want to, he lives in the USA, uh, if you want to just uh, send by mail uh, a disc to him, he is happy to copy the whole thing for you and send it back to you. So that's the service that Michael has been willing to offer. Thank, thank you well, so thank much. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it 500 AJ or 320? Or? Well, the minimum amount of size you'll need is 330 gigabytes. So, so it's best buying a 500 gig disc, probably. Okay. Yep. You can add to it then, like as more stuff goes on YouTube. You can, you can download it and add to it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's that. Now, perhaps I should give people your details, Michael. Um, your email address, should I provide first? It's Angel One Day. One. That's a nice one. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> At AOL.com. So you get the uh, inference. <laughs> uh, Just a little expectation on myself. <laughs> Just set up some low expectations for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and would, would you be happy? Remember, this goes to the whole world if we give you. Are you better if we just leave it like that? No, oh, you mean the phone number two? Yeah, yeah. 321 <laughs> in the US, 321 433 1920. So if you would like to have Michael make a copy of those discs for you and you haven't brought a copy, if you have brought a copy, we'll try to do as many of the copies between myself and Michael while we're here. Do you want to write Mike Bailey on that? Oh, sorry, yes. I need to write Michael's name. And it's your A-E-L. A -E -L. A -E -L. Okay, so that's Michael's contact details for those of you who would like to have that service. It actually is great because it, 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 it means you don't have to carry on hundreds of DVDs or anything like that. You've just got one disc and everything's on it. And you can actually produce DVDs from it if you wish. So it's easy enough. They're all in high definition, most of the videos. So um, it means that you can produce DVDs from it if you wish to, to give to other people. But you still have the master record of everything that's on there. So, so that's the option. Hello, Tim. Hello, Jackie. How are you? You can close that door if you wish. Yeah, yeah, we should. We should be right. I think pretty much chefs everyone. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> 
So how, how, there must be quite a few states represented now. Yeah. <laughs> we have Florida and California, Philadelphia, New Mexico, New Mexico, Washington, Washington, <laughs> South Carolina, Texas, Texas, Texas. <laughs> New York, Tennessee, New York. Tennessee. Tennessee. Uh -huh. Wisconsin, <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> Nevada, Nevada, oh, wow. Georgia, Georgia. So is that all, them all? Pretty. Oh, Oklahoma. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, myself and Mary have never been to most of those places. <laughs> Mary's, this is Mary's first time in the US. So, um, <laughs> so Mary's used to travelling the world quite a lot, but but she's first time to to the US. So uh, so, so we've been looking for <laughs> So one of the first things we did when we arrived was we t I took her to P.F. Chang's. <laughs> it's one of my favourite restaurants in the world. I've been hearing about it for four years. She has, she has. And so we went to P.F. Chang's the very night we arrived <laughs> and had an awesome meal. It was really lovely, vegetarian, vegan meal. So. Um, yeah, and we're looking forward to going again. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we, we have really enjoyed going around to different countries because with every different country, there is a different set of backgrounds, if you like. And, and therefore, of course, there's a different set of emotional injuries as well involved in certain countries. So, so it's interesting when you go to a country it's very, very different than just hearing about the country or hearing about people. When you interact more, you get a far better idea of, of the, what kind of uh, problems and issues that you face. And before we begin every session, when we go to a different country, if you could just turn off those mobiles for us, that would be good. Um, before we go to a different country, uh, when we go to the country, we usually, before we give a talk, we talk to our spirit friends about what they feel are the issues you're facing. So what we'd like to do first in this presentation is to uh, make a list of some of those things that they said for you, oh, if that's wow. all right. That'd be great. So, yeah, so um, it, it shouldn't take long, um, and hopefully I'll remember most of it. I think I've got some of it written down somewhere, which I'll just grab. And we find this is very, very helpful generally because um, this helps us outline, if you like, some of the general issues. Welcome. Welcome, Tom. And is that Nick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I yeah. last, last time I saw Nick, he was five foot ten. <laughs> <laughs> now he looks like, what, six four or something? Yeah, four. And, uh, and before the time I saw him before that, he was probably more like five foot five or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's changed quite a lot. So what, the, what we've done is we um, have, as I said, we sit down most of the time just before a session, which we did this morning, and we channel a bit of information from, spirit, from spirits about the different problems that you uniquely face in, in a particular country. So every country does have its unique issues and, and problems that everyone <coughs> needs to face emotionally if we're going to grow. And, one of the things they mentioned is that they wanted to give you a list of the different issues that are preventing your growth, yeah. right? or preventing things from changing rapidly for you. Many of you have experienced that you've changed a bit when you first found the Divine Love Path, yes? But, but some of you feel a bit stagnant, and what, what they wanted to do was list some of the reasons for, these, for, the, for the issues of stagnation that occur. Does that make sense? Okay, so the first one we'll start with, with is fears. You will have none. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is. And one number one fear they listed uh, was the fear of emotional and physical discomfort. Now, does everyone understand that? So emotional discomfort in the sense of when there's emotions such as painful emotions like sadness or, or even emotions such as anger come up, 
there's a degree of discomfort in, in even noticing those emotions, let alone allowing yourself to feel them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if you fear the emotional discomfort, you will, you will have a tendency to desire to prevent your emotions from flowing as a result. If you fear physical discomfort, you will often choose to do things only when it gives you comfort. And so therefore, often, there is a demand coming out for everyone around me to make me emotionally comfortable and everyone around me to make me physically comfortable. And because of those two types of discomfort, these demands come out of us, and the demands that come out of us prevent us from growing in love. They prevent us from being more loving. Does that make sense? Does there anyone want to ask about that at all? No? You can ask whenever you wish, by the way. <coughs> and by the way, when you ask, there's a microphone that we're just going to point in your direction. Um, so don't be put off by it. It needs to only be a couple of metres away from you So when you ask a question. But that way we get to hear the question that you have. <coughs> so, so we just bear that in mind. Number two, they mentioned this. The fear of having to change. In other words, many uh, our spirit friends feel that for many people in the US, there is a strong desire to continue in the same way of life as you've been taught that you can expect. And there is a deep fear of having to change that way of life into something that's different. And, uh, and as a result, and, and by the way, something that could be more loving in terms of how, what happens. But as a result of that, because of this fear, we're automatically resistive to, to embracing more loving ways of living. So, so we even become um, almost in denial that there is a more loving way of living when we do that. So that's one of the things they've mentioned. And the third involved with that is changing without the E, of course. So Michael will pick me up every time I spell incorrectly. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> changing the way of living is one of the things they mention specifically so that we can become more loving. So, so many of us are afraid to actually embrace the process of more personal responsibility in our living. Now, when I say more personal responsibility in our living, I mean in three or four primary areas of our living. The first one that I mentioned is terms of your water supply. In other words, many of you are very dependent on somebody else pumping water to you rather than catching your own water and using that to drink. Now why might that be essential, do you think? <laughs> the water supply might not always be there. If the water supply is not always there, what will happen then? What happens then? Now you're completely dependent on power and pumping and all sorts of other things to ensure that you can have your basic survival needs met. Right? One other thing they mentioned is your own food supply. In other words, many times, because, you know, one thing we notice here in the US, and Mary is yet to be at a shopping centre. Oh, well. <laughs> we, went, we went to Sprouts, which uh, Robin said to us, well, we got, I'm going to take you to a little store, or something along those words. She said, we went to Sprouts, and that's about the size of our shops basically and so um, in Australia so so we've yet to go to one of those big acre things that you have here. <laughs> but one thing I noticed last time I was here and I've been here many times of course so um, one of the things I've noticed over those times is there is just so much choice <coughs> that you have isn't there yes. many of you are used to having huge amounts of choice available to you how do you feel when you go to the shop and the thing that you wanted isn't there. <laughs> How do you feel then? For many Americans, I notice there's a frustration and an irritation. There's almost this expectation that it should be present. 
that particular thing, whatever that particular thing is. Now, if you think about that, firstly, there's a, that's a demanding expectation put upon the shop or, or, or upon the society, which is an unloving expectation of society that they provide you everything that you need. But secondly, because of this wide variety that's available to you, you have the ability to just go to a store and pretty much get anything you want. And therefore, less inclination to actually produce what you want for yourself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, of course, again, if something <coughs> happens in your society with regard to the economy or in, with regard to maybe earth change events or any other thing that could happen in your society, and there are indications, particularly with your economy, that uh, things are not as good as they could be, and that your national debt is growing uh, at extremely, extremely la large rates. Um, and all of these things could trigger events in the future. And unless you have at least some degree of self-sufficiency, you may find yourself struggling quite, quite a lot. The third thing they mentioned is your own comfort. In other words, being responsible for um, how you make yourself comfortable. So at the moment, um, in most developed societies, comfort comes from what the society provides to us. So in terms of electricity, for example, power, fuel, and so forth. So at the moment, you have the comfort of being able to get in your car and go down to the cinema anytime you want, even if it's like five miles away. You still can go. Because you, as long as you've got some fuel in the tank and you've got a vehicle, off you can go. And a babysitter. And a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps some other things there. But, uh, but it's fairly easy to get what you want in terms of your comfort. If, if you're at home and you're too cold, you just turn up the heater. And there's not much else you need to do. And that power then comes, and as long as you're able to pay for the power, you basically have the heating you want. Now, if you're taking responsibility for your comfort, you won't be as reliable on others to provide you with comfort, and you won't have a demand coming from you that they provide your comfort. In other words, you won't expect that they do all the time. And the key with determining whether you expect it or not is what happens when the electrical power goes off? How do you feel? Is it the same feeling you have when you're in the shopping centre <laughs> and you can't get the thing that you wanted? Same feeling. If it's the same feeling, one of expectation or, and therefore a bit of annoyance or anger, then that's telling you there is a demand there. There is something that's demanding going. And um, with regard to uh, the fourth thing is just shelter. And most of you have no problems with shelter. Like you've all got a home, I gather. None of you are living on the streets at this point? It's a valid question, but is there anybody living on the streets at this point? I'll just modify the talk a little bit if you are. But, but for most of us, we have, we have like our homes, we've got shelter and so forth. And, and, but for many of us, the location of the shelter isn't very practical. So for example, we might live in apartments like this building, for example. And, and therefore, it's very hard to provide these other three things if something goes wrong. Right? So what our spirit friends are encouraging you to look, to look at is changing your way of living to take more personal responsibility for those things. Now, for some of you, that's going to mean even changing where you live if you did that and so that you could be more personally responsible for your life. The beauty of personal responsibility for your life is there's less demand coming out from you towards society to provide you what you need. The less demand coming out of you, the more loving you're automatically being. So, so if we remind ourselves of, about love being the guiding principle, then we will always want to take more personal responsibility. But also, many of us are used to getting exactly what we want whenever we want it. Isn't that the case, pretty much? And then if that demand isn't met, we usually get upset in some way, like angry, disappointed, feel hurt, or whatever. And changing our way of living needs to occur just to help us to, to stop demanding from other people that they give us everything that we want, and, that, and also to teach us that we are able to be self-responsible, that we're able to be self-sufficient and self-responsible in our day-to-day -day life. So that's part of their suggestion. 
Now, they say that they are fears that many of you are not even seeing at all that you have. And the reason why is because most of your comforts and desires get met at will, you can't see that what fears are associated with what happens if they weren't there. So my suggestion is to have a feel about if all of a sudden tomorrow there was no power, no fuel, no shopping, right? just those three things, no power, no fuel, no shopping, how would you feel? Can you see that your level of fear would instantly rise up quite, quite greatly, wouldn't it? Just with those three things taken away. Now, a person who is self-responsible, if there was no power, no, no shopping, no fuel, they'd be perfectly happy. Because they know that they can provide everything that they need anyway, and they're fine, and they're not dependent on those things for living. Do you see the difference? And so one type of person is going to be extremely confronted. The other person is going to be perfectly happy. Right? With any change in the external environment. And this is what helps us. Um, and one of the things they said to us is that many of you are going to be very resistive to us mentioning these things to you. Because, because you're so used to not even seeing these things as fears. It's just a normal way of life that you've had for many, many years. And most of us in the Western world are exactly the same. We've had for many years able to get whatever we want, whenever we want it, and able to do it relatively easily. When I say relatively easy, many of us work quite hard, but it's relatively easy to get all these things we need. And as a result, we don't see that these are actually fears inside of us. Instead, we just see it as, well, I should expect that from society. I expect that we should have those things. And the key is going to be, if you take these things away from you, and, just, and you don't even have to take them away, you can just imagine them being taken away, and allow yourself to feel about it. What would you then feel? Because that's the real feeling that's still within. That's the feeling that's still there. So if you let yourself address that, that would be that would be wonderful. No questions about that. No. Everyone else going real quiet there. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bit worried about that one. <coughs> so what's AJ talking about? I'm not afraid of all those things. I thought he was going to come up with something more significant. <laughs> That's pretty significant. <laughs> Mind you, don't. This is not me, this is your spirit friend saying this to you. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring that up because... I'll just three, wait for the oh, mic to come down. Oh, my apologies. Yeah. You don't have to hold it close. All right. Um, all three of those that you've mentioned are what I've been working on, like, yeah. very closely. Yeah. Um, I notice that when I go to actually turn the faucet on and I see the water come out, yeah. I have this feeling, this is going to end soon. Yeah. And so yeah. I've been scouting out um, property in Arizona. Yeah to specifically to um, confront yep. all three of those that we're talking about. Yep. And um, so if anybody's interested, um, that's, I'm, I'm looking yeah, yeah. in that direction if people want to do it too. I'm doing it with or without anybody. Yeah, yeah. But um, all three of those have been really, really, I can just feel it. It's just, it's, I can feel it. It's coming. Yeah. And uh, I'm mean, not saying tomorrow or next week. But. And the key is to not then go into fear again <laughs> about no, all of that the, the emotional discomfort especially yeah because as i sit on my sofa i'm getting like really really present with oh wow you know i have a sofa <laughs> you know like yeah. you know like i need to not have a sofa for a little while and, and, and just feel what that feels like right that. like be able to just emotionally be able to just pick up and yeah. walk away from all of that if yeah. i need to now many of you i know have been for many uh decades concerned about what might happen in terms of earth change events and so forth. Some of you don't believe in them and I accept that and others of you do believe they're going to happen and, uh, and I'm happy to talk with you about that. But what I was thinking of doing is the general plan today and tomorrow is to just mention what our spirit friends have said and then we'll talk about a subject uh, today and tomorrow about love, a lesson in love that I'd like to talk about which is about love conquering evil or love overcoming, having the power to overcome evil. 
And uh, then by sort of lunchtime tomorrow, or just after, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have that are more to do with your uh, way of life, what might, where might be safe locations if a person's interested in that area, in terms of the USA and so forth, in terms of to live, and how to live more, uh, in terms of what to focus on, in terms of how you're living. So I'm happy to help you address some of those fears tomorrow, in the afternoon session tomorrow, before we leave. Our general plan of action is uh, we'll be going through to about 6 tonight and then uh, we'll start again at 10 in the morning and we'll go through to about midday and then we'll start at 1 and go through to about 3. Is there any one of you who need to leave tomorrow? Have you got flights out tomorrow? Things like that? Some of you already have? What time are those flights? Do you mind? Five. Five? Five. So three is okay if yeah. we finish the bed? You're all right. Evening. Evening. So you're right. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, look at the second thing. The other thing your spirit friends wanted to look at, uh, wanted you to examine, is your demands. Okay. Now they feel this is a general thing for the USA, just a general feeling in the USA. Is the first one was demands that the world provides. What you need. Now, one of the reasons why they wanted you to examine this is because, um, and this is a sensitive subject for many of you, I must say, um, many of you are not aware of the impact that your day to day decisions are having upon the rest of the world and wars that occur in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So, so it, for example, the desire of the USA to go to Iraq. Many of you are still not wanting to face the truth about what's the underlying motivations. Now, one of the underlying motivations was a need for security, a need for personal security. So that tells you that many of us in the USA are very afraid of not having security. So afraid that we're willing to go to war to create security. So we're willing to kill other people to create security. So that's a very strong fear, obviously, for, for us to be that strongly motivated to create security. So there were the events that were used as a justification at 9-11 to do that. So the second, the second part of that is the willingness to feel, when you don't have security, your own grief. Does that make sense? rather than to take revenge to actually feel your own, your own grief. You, you think if everyone in the USA at the time of 9-11 felt their own grief, there would also at the same time be a strong desire in everyone to never create that same kind of grief in another place of the world. But unfortunately, because of the lack of feeling of their own grief, there was a desire to create the grief, same kind of grief in another part of the world. And unfortunately, far more people have died, civilians have died in other parts of the world as a result of that choice. And we'll talk about that in terms of the lessons of love that we go through, and in terms of more of a general way. But if you can think about that, and then think about your own personal addiction to, to security, your own personal addiction to not grieving your own pain, because they are, those two subjects are very linked. Right? When you don't grieve your own pain, there is a desire to create pain in other people. And when you are afraid for your own security, you then take what is called preemptive action to, to make yourself feel safe, even if that preemptive action is violent in nature. And this is a very damaging thing to the rest of the world. So this demand that the rest of the world provides you what you need in terms of safety, security, but also in terms of oil and other resources, this is something to look at in terms of your lifestyle. Does that make sense? So, so this is about dealing with different emotions that affect your lifestyle. Marina? It's all right, you can walk in front of other people. Okay. <laughs> you have to do it when you're on the line. Okay. Um, 
How can someone trust, whether they're living or past, that feeling the grief would change that? Like, without that faith? Is, Let's that is someone. a very good question, Marina. Mm -hmm. And one question I'd like to address in the discussion on lessons in love that I'm about to raise. Because most people don't have any confidence that love overcomes evil. Mm -hmm. most, m most of people on the planet believe that force overcomes evil, mm -hmm. not love. And this is a primary problem with the world today, is that we have a sense of hopelessness about love. Yeah. We sort of feel that it's nice to talk about love, but it's not practical. It doesn't practically change things. And so, and, and so we have some quite frightened emotions that we need to address. So that's why I want to talk about this subject of, of, of the, the power of love and a, as a lesson that we need to, to address. Yeah. That seems hard, if, especially if you've never felt that ever, potentially. I agree. I agree. Yeah. If you've never felt any power of love and you've only ever seen in your own life when force or evil has done its work, and that's the thing that's been responded to, it's very, very hard to trust that love is the guiding force of the universe when, when the opposite of love has been the thing affecting you personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank I, you. I agree. And we had some spirits today come to us uh, when I started thinking about the subject of our talk today. And there are women spirits who were very frightened and they, they don't see love as a guiding force at all. They see security as their main issue. And that's interesting given the demands we place upon the world for security. We want security. And we're not even interested sometimes in love. We're interested in security, safety. Safety first, then maybe love and, and sometimes love is quite low on our list yeah. um, are we going to talk a bit about denial because like I had a lot of fear in me that I was in denial of yes and it wasn't until I was willing to actually go into the feeling of just how denied of safety I was as a child yeah. that it all started to come up yeah well, it's interesting you raise denial as an issue because that's the third thing your spirit has <laughs> have written down for us to raise with you. But I'll, I'll get to that after we've mentioned the second thing. Um, the, the second and third things about our demands is this demand that God changes his laws for me. <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> right? Now, the way this demand comes out is that, is that we want the rules to change. We want God's laws to change. We want the rules of love to change. And so what we then do is we start having a resistance inside of us to accepting the different laws of love, if you like, because there are laws involved with love. And we have a resistance to accepting them. We try to resist the process of that God is actually asking us to change. Instead, what we want is for God to change for us. We want God to change the law for us in this particular case, whatever the case is. So, and this is particularly the case when we have pain to feel. We want God to change the rule so that somebody else feels the pain and I don't have to. That's what we have a tendency in doing. Right? So have a look at that one because it is a very big <laughs> issue in, in most of Western society, but also the whole world generally. We, we want this, this whole concept that, that God has laws of love feels very foreign to us. And so what we want to do is we want to think that there's no laws involved in love. There's no principles involved in love. Love is... Love just is. You hear a lot of New Age things say that. Love just is. No. Love is more than just being. Love is a powerful force. Uh, it's not just something that is. It's something that has its own laws and principles involved with it. Something that actually has truths associated with it that we need to come to terms with. The third thing they mentioned is that many of us expect... Spiritual development on 
I liked. <laughs> What do you think they mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> they did explain what they mean, but what do you think that might mean? Easy. Easy. Given to you, and then all of a sudden you, there's some hey presto, I'm changed. Right? That's, that's what many of us expect, right? We expect spiritual development to be just on a plate given to us without there being any real need for any personal change, any personal effort to be involved in the change. And, and in fact, many of the forms of spirituality that are on the planet have that kind of feeling in them, don't they? So even a lot of Christianity has now become a Sunday thing where you go and get entertained. Right? And, but, but it can't confront you. If it confronts you, then you don't want to go. <clears throat> so you go to get entertained. It's all very happy, all very nice. You feel a bit of divine love in that process because you feel happy. <coughs> And you become quite addicted to that, but there's no need for any personal effort or change involved. Right? And a lot of New Age development is very, very similar. New Age spirituality is very similar. Um, it basically says that um, you can have instant change. So many people now, we notice with, this was particularly the case when we were in England, many of the people we met in England were almost completely overcloaked by spirits. About 45% of our audience were overcloaked by spirits permanently in their life. Right? Every single day of their life is run by another <coughs> spirit. And, and it's very interesting, every single one of them described almost the similarity of a sequence of events that led up to the overcloaking. And they actually remember the day it began. They actually changed their name on that day, in for many of them, to a new name. They gave themselves a new name. Right? And they began from that day living a completely different life, like they were a different person. And there is this general acceptance in New Age theology that that's a good thing. Does that make sense? This instant change, that's a good thing. Character, <coughs> which is the way God wants us to change, by developing our character, our nature, into more love, takes time to change. So this whole idea that change can be instant is a very, very uh, flawed idea, flawed concept from the beginning. Change cannot be instant. We need to, act, and change requires some effort. It's not something that somebody can just give to us. So, so oftentimes what we finish up doing is we go along and listen. You know, we like our ears being tickled, as the saying goes, right? <coughs> we, we go along and listen, and we think, wow, that was really good. It was really good to be present there that day. I learnt a lot that day, and yet afterwards our life barely changed. So that tells me that you heard a lot that you liked, but you didn't like it enough to change. Right? And this is where spiritual development on a plate is a, is a bit of a problem. And we have the same problem in Australia, where a lot of uh, people we meet in Australia expect to continually get everything for nothing without there being any effort required on their part to do anything. And so we have quite large audiences, as you can see from the videos in Australia at times, and many of the people still in the audience come only so that they can be cheered up for four hours. Right? And then they go back to their life, and then they come back to be made feel happy again the next time there's a talk or something like that. Now that is not helpful for spiritual development. True spiritual development is requires a character change within inside of us. It requires some kind of change that occurs inside of us, not something that we can just go along to examine externally without there being any life-changing thing happen to us internally. And when I say life-changing, I don't mean changing your life externally so much, but, but actually character changes happening inside of you where you no longer feel driven by the same negative emotions because you've made some changes and you know you have, you can feel you have, that kind of thing. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask about what you just said about the overcloaking. Can, I just, can you come around the front of it? Okay. That's okay. it. That's so it okay to ask a question about the overcloaking sure, you just yeah. mentioned? Anytime it's okay to ask any question. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So if these people are completely overcloaked and they had their wake up moment and they started living this other life without doing all the internal changing. Mm -hmm. So when they when they die, they're going to be faced with who they really are. Well, the, the first thing that happens when they die is the spirit who's overcloaking them has to disconnect from right. them. Right. So the person they thought they were for that period of time right. no longer exists. Right, so that's that's a real tough moment, I'm it's sure. It's a tough moment, very tough moment. But so my question is, in the meantime, so these people are walking around feeling all zened out. Zened out, overcloaked happy, and relaxed, peaceful. You know, doing always. their thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how do they get unovercloaked if they're, you know, do they have to become aware that they're overcloaked, or if you, if your friend, because I have a lot of friends who are overcloaked this way that I'm very aware of. Yeah. Do I, you know, do I just pray for them because some of them like dropped out of my life as soon as I got on the divine love path? Of I'm course, sure they yeah. were spirit guided to spirit do that. Spirit guided to do that, yeah. And firstly, pray for them certainly because yeah. prayer has a huge effect on the person. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the only way they can really release the overcloaking themselves is for them to look at their addictions. When a spirit overcloaks a person, it's always because of an addiction in the person. Now, for many, it's an addiction for power, or an addiction for glory, or an addiction to feel peaceful, or an addiction like to avoid some of their own life. There's some people who we know in Australia who, who they can remember going through this process of never wanting to live their own life again. And in that moment, they got overcloaked by a spirit. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, they changed their name, and they became happy. They changed every single passion they had even. So before they were interested in one thing, and then after they were interested in completely different things as a result. And they remember the exact moment, which was they didn't want to live even their own life anymore. They didn't want to and They don't want to feel their feelings, what's exactly. really going on. That's what's really right. going on, yeah. So, so the only way to really help a person who has a desire to, to allow that to continue is by helping them examine their addictions. If, if they're, they're willing. willing. If yeah. they're willing. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So and sometimes you can't do anything. Sometimes you can't do anything but yeah. pray for them. because uh, and, and there are spirits who engage help trying to assist them when you pray for them, more mm. so than if not. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, unless they're willing, it's very hard for even those spirits to actually help the person. So if somebody, I'm a healer and a channel, and if somebody came to me for a session and I saw that they were totally overcloaked, which happens plenty of times, I bet, yeah. but they don't know anything about spirit attachment and overcloaking, and I am very strongly feeling I can't just sort of put that on the plate. Am I just going to try to nudge them into the direction of feeling their emotion and hoping that that helps them too? Um, Truth is the most powerful force aside from love. So my suggestion would be to tell them the truth. Oh, okay. If you just can put see, it out there. You just tell them exactly the truth, but give them as much information as you possibly can. Okay. So the truth is, I don't know if I can help you very much because you at the moment are overcloaked by this spirit that I can see. Okay. Now this spirit, and tell them a bit about the spirit, the yeah. personality of spirit, what you observe. Yeah you know, their age or any other thing, yeah. any other details that you know. Mm -hmm. And just say, now, inside of you, then something must have happened for you to have a very close association with this spirit. Yes. And just be honest with them. Okay. And let the truth do its work. Now, as for some people, that when the truth hits them, they get angry. So right. that's okay. So, just so let, I, let I have to move my fear in terms of their reaction. Yes. Your I, fear of saying the truth. Because I can feel that they're not going to like what I say, and so then I, I get like paralyzed in myself. And I suggest to you, though, it's yeah. mostly the spirit who is not going to like what you Yeah, you're I know. You're right. Totally. Right. I get so, that. So what yeah. your fear is, is of spirits yes. who are angry. That's right. And, the, yeah. and you're afraid of them and what yeah. they might do to you and your yeah. life, right? I am, yeah. <laughs> actually, now that you mention it. Yeah. <laughs> so what do I do about that part? <laughs> that causes you then yeah. to withhold the truth from the person. That's right. Yeah. So what I would do if, if I was feeling that same thing is I'd allow myself to just sit down and go, okay, I'm afraid of angry spirits. What I need to do is feel why I'm so afraid of angry spirits. What, what inside of me causes me to feel really worried when there's angry spirits around. Okay. So when a person comes in who's overcloaked, what you're often feeling is that the spirits coming in and say, yep, yeah, I'm going to let them go and do the healing, but don't that healer say anything about yeah. me being with them. That's right. And I can actually feel that happen because I'll, I'll forget for a second. Exactly. Yeah. I'll be like, what? 
what was I going to say? You know, just have a blank yeah. moment. And that's your fear of what they are threatening okay. you with. Okay. Does that make sense? What yes. the spirit is threatening you with. Yes, and thank you. This is yes. really helpful. So a lot of the time, the person mm -hmm. is coming to a healer because they want to change. Right. Right? So, so you need to allow yourself to understand that initially. Like, they're coming to me because they want to know the truth. They want to just, you know, if they didn't want to know the truth, they'd be sent to a different healer who wouldn't tell them the truth. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. The reality is uh, the spirit would be guiding a lot of the interaction. If the, person, if the person really wanted to know the truth, the spirit can't prevent them from knowing the truth. And the, and the person, through their soul condition, will be drawing themselves to you. They'll be, pull it, they'll be pulled to you mm -hmm. as the healer. Mm -hmm. So embrace that process. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're with me because they must want to know the truth. Just mm -hmm. assume they must want to know the truth, the right. person. The spirit, the feeling you're getting from the spirit is, don't you tell them the truth, yes. otherwise, you know, and there's some blackmail and threats and bribery in that. And what I would right. do is I'd address what they can bribe or blackmail within me okay. that prevents me from saying the truth. Yep. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's really helpful. There's a lot you can do to help people who come to you uh, by just being honest. Yep. I'm going to really do that. Yeah, that's good. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, so there are those three things that are mine. Everyone's fine with those? You're all fine with those. <laughs> <laughs> can you see? Can you see? Tom? So I have a question on that instant change, how you put it on a plate. Yeah. Isn't that the way Christianity is said? You go down, you claim, I'm a change. I accept, and now I'm now I'm changed. Exactly. Uh, if you look at almost every faith, there's there's Christianity, right? And that says I'm instantly changed by belief in Jesus' blood. That's basically Christianity. Now, um, New Age says, says, I'm instantly changed by a spiritual metaphysical experience. Now, there's hardly any difference between those two things when you think about it. They're both saying that instant change is possible, which it's not. And they're both saying that there's something external that caused their instant change when actually true change can only happen internally. Yep. So they're very, very similar. Yeah, very similar um, in a lot of ways. Now, true Christianity doesn't say that at all. You know, what I taught in the first century is very, very different to what people are teaching now in Christianity. I mentioned character all the time, the need for moral development, for character, for, for changing the way we feel. But, but a lot of that gets ignored because we have as a society a very strong desire to have instant change. And why do we have that? Because we don't want to feel the pain of a slow change. We don't want to actually go through a process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big issue. Big issue, I feel, on the planet. Yeah. I think it's more than that. I if think. we just point it over there. <coughs> Come around the front here. Okay. Sorry, it's just if we, get, if we don't get the voice, then you'll be very annoyed when you hear it. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of denial that there's anything wrong. I mean, this idea of needing to change. Um, I know it personally, you know. Yep. A lot of new age stuff is, you, there's nothing wrong. You know, yep. you're fine just as you are. Yeah. And just be present. And, yes. There is a big uh, idea in new age theology, isn't there, that you're beautiful the way you are. You don't need to change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And if we were all beautiful the way we are, there'd be no war on earth. So obviously we're not all beautiful the way we are because we, we are a part of this system that creates war. So we need, we need to see that just by the external results that we can't all be beautiful the way we are. There needs to be some change. And also there's so much shame inside that we do not want to exactly. even look at at all. Shame is a huge it's motivator a huge to motivation. not change. Yeah, I agree. In fact, that's what our spirit friends uh, wanted to write with you, you know, the things in denial of. <coughs> So what, the third thing they wanted to mention to you was there's denial of certain things, particularly in the USA, in Northern America, that's different to the denial of different things in different countries. So like when we were in England, there was a deep denial of 
of spirits, uh, uh, spirit overcloaking and spirit influence. So the very first talk, uh, we had spirits interfering with all sorts of questions and there was a guy that I eventually had to ask to leave who was, who was just spirit overcloak, yelling out things all the time. And he went across the road and then he talked to a guy who was drunk in the pub across the road and then the drunk guy came out, spirit overcloak and into the auditorium and he started saying the same things again. And like, so there was all this denial of all that kind of thing going on. So we went to Sweden, there was a strong denial of emotion in Sweden. Very stoic strong denial of emotion. Every country has its own issues. In Australia, we're all laid back and apathetic. You know, we're, we're happy with anything. <laughs> so, um, as long as we don't have to change. Right? <laughs> so, um, the first thing they wanted to mention, which is what they felt was the biggest, is, and this is going to be hard to take, They're saying that they feel that, they, that many have their hearts closed to love and they see love as a bartering system instead. Do you understand what I mean by a bartering system? Like, I'll do this for you as long as you keep doing this for me. I'll give you this as long as, I'll do that for you as long as. And what they feel is that many of you feel the barter is love. So they sort of feel like, many of you feel, oh, I love being with that person, not understanding that actually the reason why you love being with that person so much is they don't confront anything in, inside of you at all and they give you exactly what you want emotionally and you give them exactly what they want emotionally and so everything seems fine. Everything seems good. Not aware that it's actually quite different. Does that make sense? Is there any questions about that at all? That one's needs a bit of solid thinking about that one perhaps. Yeah? The problem with seeing barter as love, and, and by the way, many of us have been brought up to see that. Like most of our lives, you know, many of us, uh, when, we, when we were young, were taught this system that as long as you give the parents what they want, they will love you. Have you ever tried not giving mum what she wants? <laughs> what happens then? <laughs> For many of you, it's like the rage of mother. You go, whoa, that's a different type of mother than I knew before then. Um, and that's because many of us are used, so used to the barter that we're used to giving it without even a thought. We, we just give it naturally. It's just normal to give it. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Could you say more about the first part of that? Can we, you point, if you point the mic down to yeah. Yeah. Could you say more about the first part of that, hearts closed to love? Yes, I'd love to. Yep. Thank you. And um, for many of you, and because the barter system is the commodity by which you work, and that, that is like a commodity, it's like a, um, it's like a monetary system from an emotional perspective. Do, do you understand what I mean by that, Michael? Like, so, so if I have a monetary system in play, I pay you some money and you give me the goods that we both agree at the time are worth that amount of money that I paid. Right? Yes. Now if I don't agree it's worth that amount of money, then I won't pay for your goods. Yes. And if you don't agree that my money is enough for your goods, in other words, the same thing, you don't agree that the money is the right value for your goods, then you won't give me the goods for the money I offer. And that's exactly what we do emotionally, for many of us. Now, because we do that emotionally, we don't have to open our heart. We don't have to risk anything, you see. A heart that is open takes risks. Understand? 
So, so what I would do if I, if I was you and I'm thinking about love, are you able to risk your heart in love? Or do you find yourself sitting back watching? So, so for example, when you, fall, or when you feel like attracted to somebody and you're not in a relationship and you feel attracted to somebody, what is your general way of working? Do you just wait, 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 wait until they show some sort of interest in you? And then go ahead and say something to them? You're looking for a sign. You're looking for, are they looking at me? Do they have the body language that seems to show that you know, they might be interested in me? What, do you find yourself waiting for all of those things? Or do you just take the risk and go up and say, look, I'm very interested in you. Now, in today's society, to take a risk is often deemed like quite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's like, it's not cool. It's not cool to take a risk. It's, it's, de it's deemed uncool, like something, something that, you, that, that is just not the right thing to do. Right? But a heart that is open takes risks. It, it, it actually exposes the truth of itself to another person. Let's look at it in terms of we're already in a relationship. When we're already in a relationship, what do we do? Many of us do not tell the other party in the relationship how we really feel. Why? Because we don't want to take a risk. What we want to do instead is we want them to tell us that they want to know how we feel. And even then, we only tell them what we think they will possibly be able to accept. If they can't accept it, or we believe they cannot accept it, we don't say what we really feel. We withhold a bit of it. Right? Now that's all telling us that our hearts are closed to love because we're not willing to take the risks that love would normally take. Now, for, for many of us, it's, it, we are so used to this because we were brought up on this. We were brought up on this whole concept that love is a bartering system and you, don't risk, have to, you shouldn't risk anything. You shouldn't have to risk anything, is the viewpoint we often have. And as a result of that, we don't take any personal risks with regard to our heart and we don't expose our true self. So what we do is we finish up acting differently for one person compared to another person. So when we're home with our partner, we act one way. When we're out at work, we act another way. When we're out at the shopping centre, we act another way. There is not a consistency in our personality because it's not even our personality. It's what does the society want me to do and that's what I do. So I'm not risking. So you've been shopping with me. Michael, I think. Yes. Yeah, you've seen me ride my trolley down the shopping centre, like, you know. On the like trolley. buying coats, when you bought coats that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen, like, how enthusiastic I am. I wear my heart on my sleeve, as the saying goes, with regard to everything I do. I went at out. Fee of Shanks. Yeah, we went out to dinner with Fee of Shanks with, uh, with Robin, and, and that's. Really cute. <laughs> You're very cute, and just really enjoyed all your food. You say I'm cute, Robin. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> and even in the in the grocery store, they were so excited about all the choices, and it was just enjoyable to watch them enjoy themselves. Yeah, yeah. So everything we do, we really enjoy it, and and it's infectious as well. Like because that's a part of my nature now, and that's how I'm with everything. It's infectious. It infects other people with the same feeling. They all feel the same way. And so that's a part of being open to, to be yourself. So when we're open-hearted, we're open about exposing ourselves to everyone around us. Exposing our true character, our true condition, our true nature. Yeah. Now, for many of you, your society has dictated to you that that is a bad idea, hasn't it? And it's very interesting when you go between Canada and the USA, because Canada is actually more accepting of individual personality. And when you go between the two countries, it's quite marked. Like, like in Australia, and it's very similar in Australia as it is here, actually, with regard to this issue. And in Australia, 
some, if you dress a certain way, you would definitely be laughed at if you walked down the street. Right? And, like, I just remember Nate, every, the way he dresses. Like, in Australia, generally, there would be some kind of laughing at him. He's, he, he dresses with a different style pants and top. He usually wears a, he, he usually wears a bit of a coat or a vest with a colourful shirt and a totally different colour tie and all of these different things. And that, in Australia, that would be looked down upon. Now, you imagine a guy like that going to a business in the USA and working in a shop. He wouldn't even be allowed to work in the shop in the USA doing that, uh, with that kind of amount of character coming out. of. Instead, what would he do? He would have to take on the shop uniform and he'd have to do that. And this is all a part of conforming uh, us to, to not opening our heart. So, so we're so used to it that we don't even think of it anymore. We don't think of it anymore. So tomorrow I'll wear a shirt <laughs> that, I, that I bought here in Texas. <laughs> that uh, most men have told me they would definitely not wear. <laughs> <laughs> and you've probably seen it before, it's that cowboy shirt. Cowboy shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. 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 And I bought it here in Texas. Um, but when I first bought it, every single person with me told me not to buy it. <laughs> because our, our hearts are clo close to exposing ourselves, like our true character. What, what I think is really beautiful is when a person exposes their true character, their true nature, their, their true feelings about everything. And you, you know that there's no hidden agendas then. There's no, there's no, it's also not difficult to get to know them. Do you understand? It's not, like it's a lot easier. You don't you don't have to work hard to get to know them. Like I find in a lot of societies, you have to work very hard before you really know somebody, and that's because we're not willing to be open and exposed. Does that help answer this? So it's a very big issue I feel in most Western societies. Um, there, are, in, in other societies, in some in some of the societies in Europe, there's a facade of openness. So, and we find that in when we go to Greece a bit, like with Greece, everyone's more expressive, but but a lot of times it's, it's the expression of rage, not 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 actually expression of their true nature. Is Italy the same? Yes, it, Italy is even more so. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, not an expression of the true nature. Yeah. Um, so I'm not encouraging you to just go out and come up with a personality that you like and then be that, because that would also be a facade. I'm suggesting to actually expose the truth about yourself <coughs> all the time. And that's very hard, initially. It's frightening, like it's terrifying initially. Yeah. You, and you think, if you think back to your school years, for some of you it's not very long ago, and for, for, for some of you you're still there, but, but if you think back to your school years, Exposing your true feelings on every single issue, how frightening would have that been? Like, you'd get ridiculed, made fun of about all sorts of different things generally, if you had done that. So there's a huge societal pressure to not expose your true feelings on issues. Is there any other questions about that issue? Yeah. Everyone gets what they're saying? Okay. Uh, two. Denial of own true condition. They're talking about here about your soul condition. Right? So, most of us want to believe we're better than we are. That's a fact. Right? There's a lot of things we get to avoid when we believe we're better than we are. Like, we get to avoid internal pain, but you also get to avoid that we were unloving to that person yesterday. And we get to avoid taking or taking the consequences of that action. Because we go, oh, I wasn't loving, I was fine, I was the person in the right, or whatever. So, so what they're suggesting is is there is a strong need to become more aware of our own true condition. 
In other words, a, a strong need to become more aware of our own true character, what, what it is within us that we actually do believe. Do, do you understand? Like, so, so for many of us, it's, if we looked at, remember the soul condition is a mixture of different things. It's a mixture of beliefs, emotions, Anything else that it's a part of that you remember? Passions, desires. Passion, desires, yeah. Memories. Memories. Intentions. Intentions. Even if we just started with those, can you see, like, if we look at our true condition, what, what do I really want? What are my real desires? For many of us, we're still struggling discovering what they are. You see, if we were more, if we were more aware of our own soul, we would know exactly. Yeah, I love this. I love that. I love this. I don't go for that much. I don't go for this much. We'd know ourselves well. So this is about knowing what we want, knowing what we really feel is important to us knowing what we want to do with our life even is a part of it as well. Does that make sense? So, what about our emotions? If we were aware of them, we would be aware. We wake up in the morning. From the moment we wake up in the morning, we'd be aware. What am I feeling right now? Am I feeling fearful, sad, lonely? All these different emotions that we have. The moment we wake up, you know, that's why we reach for the cup of coffee most of the time. Because the cup of coffee helps us get over this feeling that I have, that I've woken up with. Right? And so, so if I'm aware of my own true condition emotionally, I'll be able to go, okay, yeah, I've woken up with sadness this morning. I feel sad. I don't know why, but I feel it, and I'm aware of my own feeling. And then I look at, okay, I must be shutting it down because I'm not crying. I'm sad, but I'm not crying. So I must be shutting it down. Why would I be doing that? I'd, I'd allow myself to see or become aware. If, with regard to my beliefs, now I'm not talking about just your religious beliefs or other beliefs like that. I'm talking more a, a lot of about our emotional beliefs. Like, do I believe women are nice people? Now, some of you guys don't believe women are nice people at all. The main reason why is because your mum wasn't very nice and almost every woman you're attracted since then hasn't been. And so you have this tendency to believe then every woman mustn't be. Right? The same applies for many of you ladies with regard to men. Yes? These are beliefs that are inside of us that we are in denial of. So, so if I'm living an alone life or living a fairly like, separate life, if I'm not, not in a, um, a, a relationship of some kind, um, then I need to look at, is this because I'm growing and changing, so therefore I've yet to attract the person, or is it because nobody in their right mind would want to live with me? <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> you know? And, and we, this is where we need to be honest with ourselves and our belief systems. Like, we got an email, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? That one about um, the women, yeah. It was pretty intense, this email that we received. It was a joke being sent around and some of our friends sent us this email. And the email listed all of the stages of development of a woman, saying how there's beauty here, beauty there, beauty here, right the way to 80. And then it said men, the same thing for men. And it said from 1 to 80, they're all the same. And uh, what did they say? Something about being led. Something they're just totally led by their balls or something like that, it said. And that was it. Now, now, that told me a lot about the person who sent me the email. <laughs> and their denial of their true attitude towards men. Yeah? And quite often, those kind of things do. Yeah? So that's our beliefs. And our memories. We're often trying to shut down our, the things that we remember that are not pleasant to remember. Have you noticed that? Like, do you find yourself doing that at times? Trying to shut down things that are not pleasant? So, so, so for example, one of your children, you're, you're now grown up and you've got grown up children, and one of your children comes to you and says, Mum, do you remember back then when you belted me? No, I can't remember it at all. 
And they said, that was pretty unfair because I actually didn't do it and my brother did it. No, I still don't remember that at all. You know? And the reason why we don't remember these unpleasant events is because we have guilt associated with them that we don't want to feel. Right? We have emotions associated with them that we don't want to feel. We can remember. A lot of times we're also unwilling to look at our intentions and our, uh, what, what we're desiring to do. You see, sometimes our intentions aren't very nice. Right? Have you found that? Like, let's say you're driving along the road on the, on the freeways and, uh, and somebody cuts you off on the freeway. <coughs> what do you find your intention is right at that moment? To kill him. <laughs> to kill him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, some people do feel that. To kill, to kill the person. A desire that, that, a desire that that person died on the road. Or, <coughs> you know, sometimes we have these very, very strong emotional responses that we deny instantly as soon as they happen. We turn them off the instant they happen. Yeah? Okay? So that's what they're talking about, yeah. our true condition. Any questions about that one? I have a question about the attributes of the soul. Does the spirit have any of those attributes, memories, or...? Uh, the, spirit can, the spirit body contains some of those things, but the actual attributes, the actual quality, the, the personality and everything else it resides in the soul. So the spirit body just has a, brain, a, a mind, which mm -hmm. is like our physical body's brain, and both of them are there for the maintain, ma the primary purpose is the maintenance of those bodies intellectually. But the soul itself contains all of those things we just mentioned. I had a, uh, someone asked me a question about uh, animals because they don't have souls. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. But they have spirit. They have a mind. Yes, spirit, body, mind. The spirit, body, mind, mm -hmm. and but yet yeah, it seems like they hold, they have emotions too. Like they feel. Um, they have instant responses to your emotions. Okay. Definitely. So they're feeling and feeding off of. Of mankind's emotions. Okay. But they also have feeling responses to all sorts of stimuli, but they don't have a memory of their event in time. They are not self-aware. Okay. Does that make sense? So like a, but we do see sometimes in animals that are like, say, like a dog that's been beat or abused at it. And yes. It's, you so know, it has a memory a of the events. Okay. Uh, that is now part of it in, in its body, actually. It's stored in its body. The fear of, it, of the event is stored in the body. The, remem the memory of the pain. But they can't put it in time. They can't actually... Mm go back and say, oh, that was only that was only Michael who beat me, but AJ <laughs> didn't beat me, so AJ's fine. And that's why <laughs> right. they just see a man and they go, they're afraid instantly of any man because of yeah, man Yeah, okay. So it's just sense? a scar in the... It's a scar in their in memory mm -hmm. that is stored in their brain of their spirit body, in their mind, yeah. Okay. And also physically as a, as a memory in their body. So you can help them release it, of course. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> of course you can. You know, I think that's that's a really good concept because you know a lot of people they, we, there's like Rottweiler rescue or pit bull rescue and all these rescue, but and they get to tolerating the attributes of the animal and not really getting into how do we heal this how animal. Do we heal the that's animal. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, we're capable of healing the animal, but only capable of healing the animal if we've already heal the same emotion within ourselves right which is often the most difficult thing to do the animal will heal naturally when we heal the emotion within ourselves and the third thing they mentioned uh, there it is. the third thing is to examine the lack the denial of the lack of love in how we treat each other. And in the environment. How we sorry, how we and and the environment. How we treat the environment, they're basically the same. So that's the third thing they mentioned with regard to denial. So, again, it's interesting to talk about love, but what we need to start examining is, you know, how are we being loving in our day-to-day -day interactions? Are we actually being in loving to the environment? Are we being loving to each other? Or are we actually skipping over the times when we're not being loving to each other? 
but that's what they're really speaking of. And the last thing they wanted to mention was a problem that is a problem generally on the planet that they also feel they want to mention was the problem of, um, I'll write it this way actually, making excuses. Um, so what we mean by that is making excuses to not love. Making excuses to keep a hold of your fear. Making excuses to, to hold on to your shame so you don't release it. So, so let me give you some examples of how this might happen. You might have inside of yourself some childhood shame regarding sexuality. Right? Now, when you grow up as an adult, often this shame is one of the most difficult forms of shame to address. So what, what you do instead is you hold on to it. You sort of deny that you're ashamed, but unfortunately carry the shame around. But then when anybody points out to you, actually, I can see you're ashamed of this particular, you know, of, of sexuality somehow, you make excuses to hold on to the shame. So, so you might say things like, oh, well, that, that's because I've never really needed to address it. Like, the chances of that kind of thing happening again are pretty remote. Or, or we say, yeah, but it, it was pretty small, you know, it wasn't that bad. Or we say, it happened a long time ago. <laughs> you know, these are all the kinds of excuses that we make to not deal with something. So what we do is we minimise the situation, we shift the blame, right? these are the kind of things that we do to, to stay away and to just continually make excuses for that thing being within us. The, the key, I feel, instead is to start looking at, oh, that thing is within me, yes, while, I'm, while this thing is within me, I am not going to be completely happy for the rest of my life while it's still within me. I'm also never going to be at one with God while it's within me. I'm also probably never going to understand love completely while it's within me. So I've got some pretty good motives to get it out of me, to actually experience it and release it. The problem with making the excuse is that we're basically making an excuse to never change, so, so that we never change, not realising that it's really like, you know, cutting off our nose to spite our face, as the saying goes. We're actually preventing our own personal welfare and growth occur to, to be improved. And, and, and we're stopping ourselves from becoming happier when we make excuses. And in particular, stop making excuses for your fear. Do you understand that? This happens very frequently, where we go, yeah, I am afraid, but of course you would be too. <laughs> if this had happened to you, and that had happened to you, and this had happened to you, and so forth. Or we say, yeah, I am afraid, but, but surely anybody would be afraid in that situation. We, we make these excuses, which cause us to be distant from the actual feelings that we need to release, if we want to get closer to God in particular. Okay, so that's basically the end of what they've said. All right. <laughs> Your guides, by the way, are very, very happy you've come today. Um, yeah, we, they come and visit Mary. So Mary gets to feel a lot of these things. That, uh, um, and they came and visit Mary, and they were just so happy that the majority of you come today, they said that there's very few people in the room with identical emotional injuries, which is very unusual for a group. Usually we find that uh, um, in a group there's often very similar emotional injuries in a group, right? And, and the fact that there's very different ones is very good sign because it means that the law of attraction hasn't been based on your addictions. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's, it's based on your desire to be here that's driven the, all of us pulling together rather than 
any addictions that we may have with each other that's pulling us together. So this is a very good sign that there is a sincere desire inside of us to, to change. So that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Welcome. Hey, Jay. I'm Peter. G'day, Peter. We just tried to go 1,200 miles to get here. How many hundred miles, Peter? 1,200. Right across the water. Really? Where do you come from? We're oh, from Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Um, we're going over there. Yeah. Yeah. There's a chair down the front. Um, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. No, Mary. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> and what is the time? Twenty after. Twenty after two. Three. What if we have a bit of a break now for maybe? Should we have a bit of a break for maybe half an hour? Is that set her up? And uh, there, are, there is some water there and some other things on that. And so if we come back in, in court by quarter to four, can we do that? Thank you.